So I'm, I'm not sure the future of work is about environments like open spaces. I think it's about skills, you know, understanding what your toolkit is, whether it's robot proof. And, you know, of course, the future is tech enabled, it's customized, it's data driven, but ultimately it's still shaped and filled with people. Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 327. Today is Sunday, the 12th of May, 2019. And this interview is with Isabel Naidu. Isabel's the head of people strategy and analytics at FIS the world's largest provider of financial technology solutions. Isabel has led the digital transformation program of people services at FIS through the very disrupted and disruptive world of financial services. Isabel takes us through how she has successfully navigated the change using data and other key mindsets, many useful learnings for anyone dealing with digital transformation. Welcome to the Minter Dialogue podcast, where we discuss branding and all things digital. I am Minter Dial, your host, and you'll find the show notes on my eponymous site, MinterDial.com. Enjoy the show. Isabel Naidu, you and I met, you and I met through a wonderful mutual friend, Kat Keeley, and um, I got to hear about some of the things you're up to, which really intrigued me and wanted me to get you on my show. So welcome to the show, Isabel. Tell us who you are in your own words and what you do. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I lead a function called People Strategy and Analytics at a company called FIS. Um, FIS is the world's largest global provider of tech, financial technology solutions. Um, So software services, consulting and outsourcing to the financial world. And we've got 47,000 people worldwide and headquartered in Jacksonville, Florida, although I am based in London and actually talking to you from London today. Wow. So how is it that and certainly when I met you, it was the first time I really came across FIS. Give us a little bit more texture as to the type of clients you deal with and uh, maybe the mix of business. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got 20,000 clients in over 130 countries, so truly global. Um, and our technology powers sort of billions of transactions annually. So we're moving over $9 trillion um, around the globe on an annual basis. And I just love that fact. I mean, $9 hmm. trillion, dollars, the mind boggles. So the chances are you're probably a user of FIS technology, although you may not know it. Uh, we focus on retail, institutional banking, payments, asset, wealth management, risk compliance, really the whole gamut of financial services. As such, then, I mean, if if we look at the revolutions and disruptions that internet and these new technologies have provoked, it must have been a really challenging time to handle things like PayPal and, and blockchain. And, and there's a lot of things going on in your space. There is a lot going on in financial services. But, you know, it's funny because we did a piece of work recently with an external organization to think about how we were positioning ourselves as an employer in the market. And one of the things that the outside agency said to us is fintech is cool. You know, people want to work in fintech. It's disruptive. It's doing cutting edge things. So you should leverage that and use that as you build your brand in the marketplace. So we have been doing that. And I think there are many advantages to working in a space like this, which is full of change. Um, And also, so to work in a tech company when you're thinking about how you look after and lead people and manage sort of digital transformations because folks are akin and familiar with technology and so they're more open to using it, I think, than perhaps in some of the more traditional, I don't know, manufacturing industries, for example. And when did FIS get founded? Oh, 50 years ago. We actually celebrated our 50-year anniversary late last year, which was good fun. We did events all over the globe and got people involved. Um, it was it was excellent, actually. So we're very proud of that. So at some level, you've been around since the beginning of artificial intelligence. That is right. So we've done the whole gamut of tech and, and, you know, had to disrupt ourselves to be able to really accommodate those changes and lead the market in what we do. I mean, surely at some level, being 50 years old, you, you're kind of... Uh, a familiar player your your installed player and therefore these technologies came in as disruptive forces it came in as disruptive forces but you know it's funny i know that people always talk about disruption as though and some people think it's a negative thing i actually think it's great you know you have to constantly disrupt yourself both as an organization and actually as an individual if you want to survive in today's world and i think that's what fis has been so brilliant at doing and certainly what we see our leaders doing too in the way that they lead 
So very agile. Very agile. So in your role, Isabel, you have been leading digital transformation at FIS. That's correct? Yep, digital transformation of all of our people services. Tell us what you believe have been the keys, because you obviously have been leading a very successful transformation. Tell us a little bit about how that transformation has come around. Yeah, I think um, data, really. If I was someone asked me what the keys are to successful transformation, I'm always going to answer with data. Um, I've been working at FIS in, in the role that I currently have for coming up to three years in June. And, and when I look back at the journey, it's been incredible. So I've worked for over 20 years in change, although maybe everyone says they work in change nowadays, given mm -hmm. the changing times that we're in. That's right. Um, but when I think about the change we've been driving at FIS, like any change journey, you need the usual things, um, strong leadership support, amazing teams, you know, willing champions. And we've got all of that. But I think the key differentiator for us has been data. Um, and it's funny because when I think about HR, which is a function that I've really, you know, stepped into and come to love, actually, uh, I've never really understood why HR professionals have been so slow on the data journey because HR were always the ones who have been steeped in data for a really long time. But the truth is that most people weren't doing anything much with it aside from reporting. So I think what we tried to do was have data informed decision making, and that's critical for any transformation. So we correlated data to impact, we've linked different sets of information. And I think when you have insights like that, you can make everyone sit up and listen um, because you're demonstrating value. And that's how you get attention to drive change. I mean, look, I run a function called People Strategy and Analytics. I'm going to be passionate mm. about data. You certainly are. I mean, at the same time, you know, stepping back, people and data, it, it can feel a little bit of a crossroads or not necessarily compatible because of the human experience and the, the foibles, the emotions and people. Yeah, I don't see it like that, actually. It's funny. I mean, you know, Minta, people say that. But in reality, data, like technology, is an enabler for people. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm very much in the people business. I'd argue that probably any business is the people business. Um, right. And however much tech you have, however much data you have, you're still going to need people and you're going to have to have people with all their nuances and all their foibles, as you say, um, that will need to be led and coached and managed. And so I think it's an enabler for, for leaders. It's an enabler for employees. It's an enabler, if you think about it, in your real life. Um, outside of work. And I'm sort of fascinated by this intersection between, you know, work life and real life and how people are prepared to behave completely differently in a work environment than they do in their personal life and to some extent have different expectations. So we're trying to close that gap with the mm. transformation journey that we're on. Um, but in real life, you know, you're getting all sorts of data and having to correlate different bits of information to make decisions. So I don't think it's much of a stretch to say we should do the same in the workplace environment. Well, at the same time, we have issues or concerns about privacy and, you know, how much are you spying on me and, th and those kinds of issues. Do you not, did you not face those? We do. I, I, of course, you know, every organisation does. And obviously you have to, you know, abide by all of the regulation and be very careful with how you use it. But I think if you can demonstrate the value that you're bringing in the data that you're using, you know, we're not just collecting data for data's sake, we're collecting it to make better decisions to enhance an employee experience. So um, I think as long as you're abiding by privacy regulations, which are, as you point out, becoming increasingly complex, um, then people are open to it. And actually, our challenge at the moment isn't, you know, that folks are resistant to what we're doing around the digital transformation that we're driving. Our challenge is actually one more of capacity. You know, how do we meet the demand? Because folks are hungry to have their work experience feel much more like their real life experience. Well, that's brilliant. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking back to my old life at L'Oreal, where we would send around these surveys to employees, and they would be written in big anonymous uh, up top, but no one believed that they were. And so those are the types of challenges you can face in collecting data around your employees, no? Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to reach a point in the world at large, because I'm a visionary <laughs> in terms of, and an optimist in the way that I think, but I'd love to reach a point where anonymity just goes away and people own the feedback that they give. I think it gives much better context to feedback, but nonetheless, you have to bring folks on a journey. So um, we actually, when we look at engagement in FAS, we partner with an organisation called Glint, which is just phenomenal in terms of the analytics that they provide. But the other thing about Glint, which is great, is you close 
a survey at 11.59 and at 12 o'clock as a manager, you can go in and see your results. So there's none of this dearth of, you know, the lag, the traditional lag that existed in HR teams while they analysed data and thought about what they were going to do with it and ran loads of working groups and maybe eventually you got your report back. You know, all of that has gone away. We've moved to much more real time. Um, and, and I think that's really helped actually for people to see the value immediately. And 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 the other thing it does, which is interesting, is it links straight into action planning. So again, as a manager, you can go in, you can see what action plans, you know, what are your key drivers for engagement on your team, um, and then go straight into action planning. So if you filled in a survey and you see somebody taking action as a result of what you said, then that's all goodness in my mind. Yeah, that sort of transparency and, and feeling that there's Absolutely. some payback to the time I'm, I'm taking to input some information. Yeah, I'm interested in just want to circle back on this idea that you want to get rid of anonymity and people own their feedback. At the same time, there's, there's this notion of whistleblowing, there's ethics calling out, uh, issues of abuse or um, uh, you know challenging HR situations where your boss if 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 I feel that the boss is going to know about it then I'm not going to be telling it because that puts in peril my career. Yeah, I think that's different though. You know, I think that if you've got a, a situation which is a situation where somebody's acting unethically, then of course you have to have the the right channels in place for someone to do that, which of course FIS does. Um, but what I'm thinking about, you know, I don't think we should legislate for the lowest common denominator. I think we mm. should create an environment where people can speak up, where you have a speak right. up culture, where it's absolutely accepted. But obviously, in addition to that, you need to have the right channels around ethics, which is mm. a huge focus for us as an organisation. But, you know, if you think more broadly and think about, you know, if you as a leader are, are running a team, then there are two things that you absolutely have to get right. One is to know yourself, <laughs> to know the impact mm. that you're having and how you lead um, and the other is to know your team and and for both of those things you have to have open dialogue and a speak up culture or you won't be able to operate in fact that forms the basis of all of our manager excellence training know thyself and know thy team well i love that self-awareness it's a topic that seems to be coming up a lot more these days and perhaps it's around the notion of competencies and, and needing to be responsible for your own training and understanding your own ethics yeah yeah, it's funny you say that, actually. So a couple of years ago, I wrote a blog about the future of learning, and I called it Meet Your New Chief Learning Officer. And uh, I was working at the time with a COO who was super astute, and he was the one who gave me this idea because he was really frustrated at the lack of accountability that folks were showing around their own development. So people were cancelling their enrolment and training and so on. And from that, we sort of developed an approach to learning, which we've brought into FIS, which is using this concept of being your own chief learning officer right hmm. through all of our learning strategy. Um, so we, we talk about it, you know, be your own chief learning officer and what does that mean? So driving that accountability into the hands of individuals to really take ownership for, for development. Well, you are, we, you and I have met for a reason because uh, the my second chapter is all about responsibility and, and uh, self-learning and so on, is uh, self-awareness, self-learning. So fully slotting in. So um, I'd lo love you, if you would, just to, to talk through some data points that you used, how you got them and how you argued them through to get that support that you're talking about, just to give us a little bit more granularity to that, if you could. Yeah, I think, you know, when you, the thing about data that sort of scares people is it's so big. Um, so if someone's setting out on a journey, I always say to them, stop worrying about the data itself and think really about the business challenge that you're trying to solve for. You know, when we began our journey, the first thing we did was sort of catalogue what were people using in terms of reports and data. And we found, no surprises here, that a lot of, you know, data was being generated and not being used. Mm. So we decided to sort of turn it on its head and say, actually, let's go specifically after a business challenge. What are the business challenges that you're trying to solve for? And then how can we use data? data to support them. Um, and then more broadly, what we did as well was we looked at particular different sets of information to feed into our actual approach. So as an example, you know, we were redesigning performance management and we looked at how people were engaging with our old, uh, rather static performance management process. And we found that most people completed their tasks in the last week of the deadline. So although we'd given people sort of a two month time period, most folks were sort of taking action in that last week. So when we launched our revamped, you know, much more immediate, real time, frequent connected um, uh, performance management 
engagement process, we actually shortened considerably the timescales that we were asking people to, to, to take action in, which, you know, little things like that, that just make sense to be able to respond to to how you're using information. And another data point I'll give you, which was interesting, is when we were designing sort of, you know, what does is, what is our manager excellence training look like and what does great look like? We went through all of our results from Glint, from our engagement survey and our provider, and we looked at what were the key drivers of ESAT um, and, and how did that impact attrition? And we then looked at those elements specifically and fed them in to our leadership training. So we were being very, very specific about the areas that we wanted to address. And you know, ultimately, I do think most roads lead to manager. You know, if you had to focus on just one thing, if you were kicking off a transformation exercise, I'd say focus on your leaders. Hmm. And uh, how do you measure the improvements of your leaders? Of the leaders themselves? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. So we look at um, various different things. And I, I guess, you know, ultimately, we're deploying a sort of leadership effectiveness scorecard and so on to our people where they can look across a whole host of metrics for themselves as leaders. Um, we're very transparent with the information that comes back from Glint, as I mentioned, so you immediately get feedback in terms of your um, team and the key drivers and where you need to take action. We also run 360s um, across our organisation for for leaders. I think more broadly, ultimately, you know, every organisation has, um, I hope, a set of people metrics aligned to their business strategy, which is what we have too. Mm. So we look in aggregate at some of the core metrics that you would expect us to be tracking around attrition and so on and so forth. But but if I think about the transformation journey, what we really want to measure is, you know, are people engaging with the services that we provide and are we making a difference in the businesses that we support? And ultimately, it comes down to that. So having scorecards is great and having overall dashboards is absolutely foundational. But ultimately, if you can embark on a transformation journey, I think you need to pinpoint what are you trying to actually affect in terms of change and then how are you going to measure those specifically? Do you get the feeling, Isabel, that this notion of this transformation journey is actually work in progress business as usual? You know, it's so funny you say that. I heard someone at an EY conference recently talk about change and transformation, and they raised this great point about how companies have been thinking about change wrong for a very long time. So if you're embarking on a transformation journey, it sort of implies that there's some finite end to it, when mm. in reality, it's about a series of small changes that you need to make that add up to the transformation. So I don't think, you know, our transformation will ever be done. But as you go along, you can measure each intervention to see if it's having impact. And I think that's probably the key you mentioned this term esat before i'm guessing that means employee satisfaction but just it is to i'm a very american term <laughs> i work for a u.s organization so i've adopted lots of americanisms and that well, is one of them that's and absolutely the, what it is and in the same uh, space you have um subsidiaries around the world 360 is a rather american approach to what extent is that followed and appreciated around the world and how does that culturally change that's interesting. I don't know if I if I think 360s is an American approach, actually, and I'd have to think about that. So I think culturally, you know, at the end of the day, as an organisation, of course, you need to be mindful of local context, and we operate truly globally in, you know, multiple countries, as I mentioned in the introduction. But I, I also think as an organisation, you have to set down some parameters of who you want to be. And some of who FIS wants to be as a, you know, employer of choice includes having a speak up culture, of being bold, of, you know, having an open um, leadership style and inclusive approach, innovative culture. So all of these elements kind of feed into who we are, regardless, if you like, of geo context. And, and I think that's really important. So with 360s, for example, part of what we believe is that the 360s drive self-awareness. So back to the know thyself and know thy team and help leaders on their development journeys. And so we would absolutely want to be able to provide that across the globe. And we haven't found we haven't found that challenging in one particular area over another hmm. um what, one of the things that's interesting with 360s i think is to sort of look in aggregate at what are some of the themes that are coming back um when you look overall not individual results so much but just the overall themes that are coming back and help people articulate feedback that's helpful um to the leader who's receiving it so i, I think too often companies go out and launch initiatives but they don't actually give people the tools to engage with them in the right way Hmm. It must be also speak to your general culture because what I can say at L'Oreal in, in France, 360s was quite an anathema concept. <laughs> but uh, anyway, moving right along, um, your 
you say you, you're passionate for employee engagement. And of course, that makes sense. The question is, how do you actually ensure healthy long-term engagement? Uh, because there seems to be, I feel around me, a lot of burnout, a lot of disengagement. I mean, the numbers tend to talk about, you know, well over 50% are not feeling engaged with their business. And around me, I just personally see a lot of people who are fatigued, overwhelmed and burning out. Yeah, that's that's it's interesting. You know, at the end of the day, I think engagement's a very personal thing. So levers are different for each individual, and for each individual, those engagement drivers change at different points in their life. You know, if I think back to the early part of my career, I was working at Accenture. I had a an amazing sort of a very intense ride <laughs> at Accenture, and and it was exactly what I needed at that time in my life. That job wouldn't work for me right now. You know, I have three small children. I'm juggling <laughs> multiple needs. I need. Yeah. Absolute flex. I travel, but I need flexibility in the way that I work. So I feel balanced. And, and ultimately, it comes down to choice. You know, if you give individuals a, a choice and they feel that they're empowered and that they have choice about the way they work, then I think that it's much easier to drive engagement. Now, not every job obviously lends itself to that. So finding ways to engage people um, within the parameters in which you're operating can be a challenge for leaders. But I think tools like Linda are good because they allow you to pinpoint real drivers. I think, you know, this concept of knowing yourself and knowing your team is great because it allows you to think about what does it mean for each individual. You know, some people would look at my life and think I'm not balanced, but for me, I'm balanced. And that's the key, isn't it? That for each individual, it's very, very different. And that's why it's so complex as well. It's so hard to sort of legislate at a top level. Mm. I, I don't think, you know, if I think about... Um, uh, big bang engagement programs with table footballs or whatever the latest craze is that's it just sort of pales into comparison when you look at the impact that you know good leadership can have on a team in understanding what people's drivers are hmm. well certainly having personal ambition that's that seems to be some element of it if you don't have the ambition side or you don't hire for ambition ambitious people then it can be trouble for them to not feel the victim of overworked yeah, you know, I read this article in Forbes the other day by somebody called Cy Wakeman. She's the person who coined that great phrase when talking about leadership, your ego is not your amigo, which I loved. Mm -hmm. um, but she advocates this concept of accountability engagement. So I've sort of been mulling that over in terms of how that might work. So we drive ownership around learning already, like we talked about, but maybe we could consider how we think about that for engagement as well. You know, what responsibility do you have to to, to try and at least articulate what your needs are to your leader so that the leader has an opportunity to try and address them. I think that's something that's sort of an interesting thing to, to, to consider. And again, it goes back to to having the right environment where people can can, can be open and transparent about, about what they feel. So we've talked a fair amount about this idea of self-learning and self-awareness to know what you need to learn. And you recently tweeted about this learnability quotient, the LQ. I thought that was rather a rather nifty uh, new idea. In, in today's world, how do you have managed to implement a, a type of self-learning program? Uh, and is, is it a question of budget, uh, firewalls? And, you know, what, how, what, are, what are the kinds of things that you go through in order to make, allow for a great self-learning environment? I, lo I loved the concept as well, by the way, which is why I tweeted it. So I'm a sucker for an acronym. So I thought, oh, we've had IQ, EQ, yeah. now we can have LQ. <laughs> um, but it really resonated with me. You know, how willing are you to learn? And, and and I don't think it is about budget or firewalls or any of those things. I don't even think that it's about the learning programs that your company kind of gives you. It's about your ability to adapt, to change, to, to learn something from every situation. So, you know, personally, I leave every meeting and I think about three things I should have done differently. Um, I learned in a meeting yesterday, actually, with somebody that you should also reflect on the things that went well. So I'm going to start bringing that into my approach. But, you know, positive I, I seek thinking. out yeah, positive reinforcement. Exactly. But um, she was actually talking about the neuroscience behind that, which mm -hmm. I found fascinating. But, you know, I seek out feedback actively. You know, they're all opportunities to learn. It's not just about training per se. And I think that that concept of, you know, making sure that people have the tools to maximize every opportunity to learn and that they understand when they're learning because you know if you talk about learning to a lot of employees it can become another thing that they have to do in an ever-expanding mm. to-do list to your point about burnout and we want to sort of bust that myth that 
um, that that's another to do. But learning is actually happening all the time if you go after it deliberately and you're self-aware. So so we're trying to teach that through through some of our manager excellence and through some of our, you know, phrasing and, and using this concept of being your own chief learning officer to reinforce that. That's not budget. That's self-awareness and reflection mm. and, and creating time and prioritizing it. The word that often comes up when I ask people on this show about their who they are, they oftentimes say, I'm curious and therefore I'm interested in learning. At the same time, I can't help but think about Brian Solis's new book, Life Scale, how Brian talks about this sort of thirst for curiosity, thirst for learning, at the same time leads you down a million rabbit holes in today's world. And so you can end up being devoured by the amount that there is to learn. Yeah, I, I can see that as a risk. And I also think, you know, not not everyone, I think this concept of the ideal employee, someone who's, you know, highly ambitious or someone who is curious, it just doesn't exist. Different roles require different skills and each one of them has an important and huge value in an organisation. Um, so I think companies need to be careful of, of creating this notion of, uh, and commentators, right? I need to be careful of creating this notion of there's one way of doing things. And, and if I go back to this um, concept of the difference between the real world and, and and the work world, if you like, in 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 the um, real world, you're you're constantly inundated with information, and you choose how you engage with it. And sometimes, you know, some people will work and love a particular app. Some people will uh, devour, I don't know, YouTube videos, whatever it may be. And people are quite clear about what they like and don't like. And I think organizations have a responsibility to sort of lay out a plethora of learning opportunities for folks to choose from. That's what we did in FIS. We created this um, curriculum that you can engage with in many, many different ways. You know, you could do traditional classroom-based learning. You can do self-directed learning. You can go in and search, you know, from curated learning from folks in the business. Business. You can sign up for webinars. You can you can do it. In, you can read an article, um, and if you want to, you don't even have to follow the. We'd rather people sort of tied it back to the competencies that we're putting out there. But if you don't want to do it that way, you can learn. You know, by searching yourself, and all of it is valued. I, I, I don't think we should be so prescriptive in telling people how they should do things. And and you're right, Minter. There is a there is a risk about you know it's just too much. But again, there's no right way of doing it. I've never been a fan of saying you know you should have a allocation of hours for learning i think that sets you up wrong from the start actually i think you should you know your learning needs are very different to mine and we should be able to have a customized experience like we do in the real world mm. yeah i think i certainly think that that is the future yet i don't believe that m most of the learning platforms that are out there are well equipped yet to give you that sort of customized personalized version it it sort of ends up being you know 18 tabs check one 15 pages on google and maybe one of them's a good or youtube and one of them's the good video that's going to give you the right information to the problem that you're trying to seek or not and and who's qualifying that and it ends up being difficult yet so i mean of course i mean i'm into it it's just that i think we'll we'll see some gargantuan improvements in the way that we can get to that tailored appropriate uh, content yeah or even that it's happening you know without you having to look for it so at the moment for example in our approach we've created this all these different learning opportunities built off our competencies and it's great it's a, it's a fantastically easy way of navigating mm. and finding stuff linked to something very specific a behavior or a skill set that you want to develop um, in a brave new world, perhaps you'd take that a step further and it would, you know, I don't know, see the way I'm operating and that I'm buried in emails and meetings and, you know, offer me uh, time management guidelines, for example. Mm. You know, that's sort of a, a, a way of thinking. Now, again, you'd have to be open to being tracked. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what companies and employees are ready for that, but I can certainly see how that might happen a bit like your, uh, if you use any of the fitness apps and so on, sort of tracks you and gives you a little tip. Um, tips and things about how you can do things differently. Hmm. The opt-in. So um, you also are uh, well equipped in talking about the future of work. And of course, this is sort of part of what we're talking about. But what are your thoughts on how to create the right environment at work? You mentioned table football, um, beanie bags to have naps, <laughs> what, open spaces, which is getting kind of a bad rap recently in the press. 
What do you think of the things that will make for the best future of work environment? Yeah, I just want to be clear. I'm not advocating beanie bags or table <laughs> sample, just in case anyone listens to just that bit. Yeah, right. um, Out of context. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, it's, it's another big question. It's, it's, not, um, it's not really the future. It's happening now. Uh, that's one thing I'll point out because I sort of laugh. I, I say myself, you know, I talk a lot about the future of work, but in reality, this is the future. Right? Mm-hmm. We're living it and sort of designing at the same time. Um, we built out our HR transformation around three core roles that we felt everyone needed to play. So we said, you know, everyone needs to be a change agent, they need to be a coach, and they need to be a data analyst. Of course, data analyst was in there. So I'm, I'm not sure the future of work is about environments like open spaces. I think it's about skills, you know, understanding what your toolkit is, whether it's robot proof. And, you know, of course, the future is tech enabled, it's customized, it's data driven, but ultimately it's still shaped and filled with people. And people will always need coaching and they'll always need help in navigating change. So I think if you focus on those two skills, you'll probably end up creating the right environment. Um, But by the way, I hope the future is also inclusive because that's something that keeps me up at night. You know, I've been a passionate advocate of driving more inclusion at work in every guise. But also personally, as someone who's lived and worked all over the world, I I really believe that inclusion is one of the most important factors to get right in, in this sort of global connected world that we're creating, that we're living in. And presumably you have to back that up with data when you argue it. I will have to back it up with data when I argue it, although I would hope that we'll also reach a day when you don't have to back it up with data because it's so obvious it's the right thing to do. Well, you know, that point, there's so many things that appear obvious, like good ethics, that yeah. still somehow we get wrong. And, and, and business pressures, performance requirements, shareholder pressure, that somehow tends to warp our ethics sometimes and and then we you know we 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 talk about numbers rather than people it's amazing how we get off track Mm. I I always bring it back to people you know I talk about our mission as being embedding people centricity and I I think that there is a swell of advocacy for that as a concept for good leadership and and I know I'm very fortunate to work in an organization that truly believes that and you know has very very strong support around the agenda that we're driving um, and I do think there is a place in companies also to have the the right policies and processes and procedures in place. And at the end of the day, you can't, I guess, in any environment ever legislate for 100 percent. But 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 I do think that there is this groundswell of movement around. It just makes good sense to do good business. And increasingly, you know, we're hearing more and more about purpose and purpose driven organizations. And I do believe that they're important. I don't think they're just words. Mm. I think people are buying in and you can see it in their buying patterns. They're buying differently. They're choosing differently because whether they believe and can see substantiated the purpose and the reality behind that with with companies. Unfortunately, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. there is data that also supports the fact that inclusion diversity and purpose separately are good for shareholder performance so hopefully the future will be yeah. easier um listen isabel thanks for coming on the show giving us your time uh tell us how we can find out a little bit more about you or or connect or listen to what you're up to great so you can find me on twitter at isa naidu and i also blog regularly on topics around future of work inclusion and leadership on linkedin brilliant well, I will put all that to help, follow, help uh, your people follow you on LinkedIn. And uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show, Isabel. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. arms
challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why Of a woman. 